Welcome to the Workology Podcast, a podcast for the disruptive workplace leader. Join host Jessica Miller Merrill, founder of Workology.com, as she sits down and gets to the bottom of trends, tools, and case studies for the business leader, HR, and recruiting professional who is tired of the status quo. Now here's Jessica with this episode of Workology. Sometimes the business case might get in the way of just doing the right thing. This happens a lot, in my opinion, when we are looking at accessibility and diversity and inclusive efforts. We often get caught up in the ROI of doing something instead of doing it because it's the right thing. It's not so much about ROI as it is with being a good citizen of the universe and making your business and workplace accessible for all, including those with disabilities. This episode is part of the Workology podcast, and it is sponsored by Workology, and it's part of our Future of Work series powered by PEAT, the Partnership on Employment and Accessible Technology. In honor of the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act this year, we're investigating what the next 30 years will look like for people with disabilities at work and the potential of emerging technologies to make workplaces more inclusive and accessible. Today, I'm joined by Ted Drake. Ted Drake is the global accessibility leader at Intuit, a financial software company that creates TurboTax and QuickBooks. Prior to Intuit, Ted co-founded Yahoo's Accessibility Lab and was a developer evangelist. Ted speaks regularly at technology conferences and is the co-chair of the 2021 Web for All Conference for Accessibility Research. Ted, welcome to the Workology podcast. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Talk to us about your background. How did you get into accessibility? I was a professional student. Um, It took me 12 years to get my degree in fine art. In the middle of that, I went through genetics and business and journalism and photography and everything else I could. I just just love being in college and learning new ideas. And I'm still trying to learn something new every day, whether it's podcasts or Twitter or articles or anything. So... I guess you could say the one thing about me is that I'm always learning. You're like a renaissance person, right? Like always learning, always growing. You're a jack of all trades. I I was the only person in my art classes that had taken statistics and genetics and probably the only person in my statistics and genetics classes that had taken color theory. Awesome. Well, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about today is to hear more about Intuit's commitment to accessibility on your technology p- platform. Can you talk a little bit about this and, and the why behind it? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, Intuit is a customer-focused company. And a lot of companies say that, um, but it is actually uh, core to what Intuit does. Our, our goal is to create exceptional experiences for all of our customers. And what I like to tell everybody at Intuit is I emphasize that all. Uh, because we always say that we want to make a great experience for our customers. But when you add all, then that's where you start thinking inclusive. And that's where you start working with accessibility. And, and I think it's, it's common nature for someone when they're designing or building or thinking about a new project that they see themselves in it. So our goal as the accessibility team is to take themselves out of it and to help them broaden their perspectives, uh, to think about people with disabilities, different genders, race, socioeconomic, family structure, the whole broad spectrum of the community and not just, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer, or I'm a designer, I'm 25 years old, I've got a huge monitor and I'm in a a perfectly lit room. And so I'm gonna design for that experience rather than I'm a mother of two children working two jobs and I'm trying to balance my budget on the kitchen table at 10 o'clock at night on my phone. Yeah, it's important to to kind of have a balanced approach to understanding your, your customers. We use empathy awareness. One of the things that's, uh, I don't know who said it, but it's like you can teach someone to design and you can teach them about accessibility, but you can't teach someone to care. So what we try to do is we try to put them in other people's uh, perspectives. And once they understand how it impacts other people, then they build the empathy. And once people have empathy, then they're much more likely to not only fix that problem that you, you presented to them, but also presenting all new problems and avoiding issues in the future. 
I like this empathy approach. And I think that most of our listeners on the podcast can really relate to that because so much of what we do is the people side of the business. Right. I wanted to ask you about how Intuit addresses accessibility requests and features. I'm interested in learning more about how you build accessibility into your product development. As I mentioned before, Intuit is a customer focused company. When we are designing new features and new products, um, and I've worked at other places that do it the other way. The other way is you build something, and after you build something, then you try to figure out how to market it. Um, that's pretty common. What we do at Intuit is we go and we meet with customers, and we watch customers as they try to do something. Like, for instance, our invoice team might go out and meet with 50 customers that are trying to write invoices. Sometimes they're writing those invoices on a piece of paper. Sometimes they're using software like QuickBooks. Um, but we ask them, like, what went well? What didn't go well? What would you like it to do? How could this be easier? Then after we figure out some of the problems that were involved in them making that invoice, then we create a prototype. Then we go back to the customers, get their feedback, and then we keep evolving. So we don't build something unless there's a problem. And so one of the key things is that we need to make sure that those customers that we're interviewing is an inclusive um, distribution of customers. We don't want them to be all, you know, 30 year old white guys that went to Stanford. <laughs> you know, we got to get, we got to make sure that they include people of all abilities, um, truly inclusive. Another thing, uh, one of our colleagues, she just wrote an article on an Intuit blog about this. We have mechanisms in our products that, uh, people can leave a feedback and all of those feedbacks get sent to a central channel. So she runs a bunch of keywords. I think we have about a hundred keywords against those um, comments to try to pull out comments that might be accessibility oriented. For instance, you're not going to see too many com uh, comments that say, I have cataracts and I can't read the button. Most people don't, when they leave the comments, they don't specify their ability. But what they might say is, I can't read the light gray text on your button. So we're looking for sort of um, keywords that might identify issues. And then we pull those out of the voice of the customer. We create a monthly report. We share that with the different teams. And we use that to keep track of what's happening, what's improving. A lot of times we get positive feedback, like I'm happy that you've made it so I can resize text or something like that. And then also we keep a group of customers that have contacted us and uh, we keep in contact with them. We let them know, here's a new feature that's coming out. Um, if they find a bug, then they send it to us. I just got one yesterday from one of our customers. I appreciate your insights in this area because I think as HR professionals, we're users of technology every day. We, we consumers of the technology, whether it's B2B in our HR roles or as consumers of our mobile phones. And, you know, I just ordered an Instacart uh, order this morning. So as a consumer of that, like I'm experiencing the tech, but as a company into it, how you address and handle accessibility features or requests, I think is, is very interesting because a lot of what I'm hearing, unfortunately, and one of the reasons I want to do more interviews with folks like you is to talk about the business case for accessibility and your approach because a lot of technology companies build their product first and then they build the accessibility features after and that's what i want to try to avoid right so can you talk to us about that a business case for accessibility approach how you do that First off, I'll, I'll say that I'm in a unique position when it comes to accessibility. Um, I truly love the, the way that this has done it into it. I mentioned before that we're customer focused. It, I've been at Intuit for nine years and I've never built a business case for accessibility. Um, I don't have to say that if you fix this issue, it's going to bring in 10 times more customers that could increase business. I don't have to say it's going to cost $10,000 to fix this. What I do is I show the teams the customer experience. So I'll say this issue is, here's the problem. Uh, this problem is going to block a customer from being able to complete this task. Therefore, it's a higher priority. Or here's an issue. 
they can still do the task, but it's a bit confusing. So we'll prioritize it as a P3 instead of a P1. So business use case, I haven't had to deal with it into it because the customer experience is more important. What we've tried to do is to incorporate accessibility into components so that when someone creates a page and they add a, let's say they add a, a set of check boxes, that the designer and the engineer don't have to think too much about how to make those accessible. They just add that component and that component's been built to be accessible. So they just have to configure it. The designer is not worrying about what font to use, what color to use. The engineer is not worried about how the label gets applied. They just have to say, here's the check boxes and here's the label text and we're all set. I love that. And, and it's, it's so refreshing to hear because again, I, have been at conferences speaking about accessibility for, for HR and for the workplace and tech companies will approach me after and say, you need to quit talking about this because it's going to cost us too much money to make this change. It's true. And also, I'll also say that our team has a really small budget. We have a very small budget and our budget is meant to focus on what could impact the entire company. We're not, our budget doesn't go to fixing a particular product. Each product owns that. So we focus mostly on tools uh, like automated testing. We focus a lot on education. We, uh, I think last year we had, uh, I want to say 800 people went through some kind of accessibility training last year at Intuit. We also sponsor events to encourage entrepreneurship like the Sagebrush Conference or the Y Summit for blind and deaf uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, That's what those two do. So we spend our time basically trying to make it possible for everyone at Intuit to include accessibility in everything they do from the very beginning, because as you said, fixing it later just doesn't work. No, it's, it's, such, it's such a problem uh, and, and a challenge, and it's, it's very costly for a lot of technology companies that are working and developing their tech, in my experience, that way. Yeah, um, and everyone will, you know, and this didn't happen overnight, it's taken... Uh, I've been into it for nine years and we've gone from one person working on this. And now we have over 700 accessibility champions that are driving the conversations and creating the, uh, the, the workshops and such. Let's take a reset. This is Jessica Miller Merrill and you are listening to the Workology podcast. Today we are talking with Ted Drake about customer service driven accessibility. This podcast is sponsored by Workology, and it's part of our Future of Work series in partnership with Pete. They're the Partnership on Employment and Accessible Technology. The Workology podcast Future of Work series is supported by Pete, the Partnership on Employment and Accessible Technology. Pete's initiative is to foster collaboration and action around accessible technology in the workplace. Pete is funded by the U.S. Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy, ODEP. Learn more about Pete at PeteWorks.org. That's P-E-A-T-W-O-R-K-S dot org. Well, one of the areas that I wanted to focus on was mentorship, particularly for people with disabilities. Can you talk about how you and others are, are helping those maybe entrepreneurs that are entering the field? You talked a little bit about the conferences, but talk a little bit more about mentorship. When it comes to mentoring, um, you know, as I mentioned before, I came into technology from an art perspective. So I taught myself how to do programming and I wouldn't have been able to do it if it weren't people uh, that came before me. Uh, People like Jeffrey Zeldman, Joe Clark, uh, Leonie Watson, especially Molly Hallschlag. These are people that spend a lot of time not only learning and figuring out problems and solutions, but documenting them and then going out and teaching others. So I feel the same responsibility. Um, Everything I do, I publish as Creative Commons. I try to be available as much as possible. There are certain times of the year when if someone reaches out to me, I just don't have the time to help. But I try to impart the same kind of mentorship I do with others. I'm not a great engineer. I, I didn't go through computer science. So there are parts of engineering I don't understand. So I recognize where I don't have those strengths. Uh, design. I know art, but I don't know design. Typography is like, you just do it. (laughs) But what I have done is I've worked hard to learn 
and to build a network of mentors and mentees, I guess. Is it mentees or mentorees? <laughs> mentees. Um, you, you need to know what you don't know, and you need to know who knows it. So that if somebody comes to you with a question, you can reach out to them and get the answers. You asked about mentorees with disabilities. Um, I've hired uh, two interns that have disabilities so far. The first one was Sarah. She was amazing. I had a problem. I needed to know what were the barriers for small business owners and accountants that, had, uh, that were deaf or hard of hearing. And there was, that was a really key research that was needed for our products to move forward. And because of that, it really required a, a person that was deaf to be able to communicate with these entrepreneurs via American Sign Language. It just, the, the communication is critical. So that's an example where I hired someone specifically because of an ability. The last person I hired, I was hiring someone that knew keyboards natively. So I wanted somebody that used a keyboard on a daily basis. Uh, so I wasn't saying you had to be blind or you had to be uh, physically disabled, but I wanted someone that truly understood keyboards. I think we need to broaden our horizons when it comes to in interns. And we need to understand that people are not always coming from the top 10 schools, that people learn in different ways. And we need to open uh, our hiring to people that have proven that they know what they're doing, but they may not have the resume. Like myself, as I said, I, I was blogging and I was interacting in the community and someone from Yahoo came to me. I did not have the resume that normally would have gone to a, a Yahoo engineer. And I know that there are a bunch of people out there that have the same. I've done several talks with people with organizations like the uh, Disabled Student Services at a university and talking about how people need to build their brand. Uh, when someone is looking for a job and they want to be a inclusive writer. They want to talk about uh, hiring practices for people that are deaf. If that's your expertise, you should be writing about that. You should be participating in the community. When someone is looking for an expert on hiring practices for the deaf, they should find your name. So one of the things I do talk to a lot of students uh, with Teach Access um, and other avenues is Make sure that people can find you and that they understand your passion. And that's how you can get into a career that uh, represents you and not just uh, you're going into a position that could have represented anyone. You're a global accessibility leader. I wanted to ask you about how you work with human resources as an accessibility leader or expert at Intuit. HR and legal are, are my partners. We're collaborators. Mm -hmm. So... They've come to me with ideas. I've gone to them with ideas, and we've worked together to, to push those. Some of the things is we developed an employee network for people with disabilities. That was based on an HR request, but it certainly helped us as we've moved forward. From our side, we've gone back into HR, and we've pushed for uh, inclusive hiring uh, job descriptions for accessible onboarding. And also our employee networks have worked to make sure that all of our buildings are ADA compliant uh, outside the United States, which is something that wouldn't have happened uh, because many countries don't have the same uh, requirements. That's, that's something that came from our employee networks. For someone who wants to learn more about accessibility programs and also building a team, you've talked a lot about that, what resources or information do you suggest or recommend that they check out? This is actually one of the best things about the accessibility community is that we believe in sharing. We don't believe in competing um, with our accessibility in general. So when someone does something or learns something or comes up with a solution, we typically share it. A great, great uh, resource is uh, from Teach Access. This is an organization between technology companies and universities. Technology companies want students to know accessibility. Universities are willing to teach accessibility, but they want to make sure that it's actually a requirement for when their students go in for job interviews. They have a really great tutorial for developers. Uh, you can go to Teach Access. I think it's teachaccess.org, and you can go to their tutorial. Uh, I believe it was done by Facebook, and it's really great. 
You can also find courses on Udacity. Google has a great uh, web accessibility course on Udacity. There's tons of videos on YouTube, TED Talks. Um, watch for annual on online events like ID24. I believe that's Inclusive Design 24. This has been going on for several years, and it's a 24 hour of speakers from around the globe um, giving presentations. There's the A11Y, A11Y hashtag. Uh, subscribe to that on Twitter for the latest news. There's a global accessibility groups on WhatsApp. I subscribe to a couple of them out of India. There's a web accessibility, it's web hyphen A11Y Slack channel. This is a global public channel that people have subscribed to over the years and there's great conversations in there. The Job Accommodations Network, I'm sure your HR partners know about this, but I use Ask Jan all the time. If I ever I have a question as to how would someone use a keyboard when they have uh, sickle cell disease, you know, what's the impact? I would go to Job Accommodations Network and see what they have on sickle cell disease in order to get some background information. It's not just for HR. Designers, engineers, a lot of people can learn from there. I also, I, I really look to what's been published by some major organizations. The BBC, the broadcasting company out of the UK, they have fantastic documentation. Microsoft's inclusive design is really good. eBay has a design pattern called Mind. I believe it's called Mind. Carnegie Mellon uh, University has um, amazing work that they've been doing with robotics and geolocation, real-time navigation. University of Washington has done some, for a dozen years, have been working on innovative user experience. And Adobe just released a new web accessibility and design resource guide, including a, it's like a, a training material, but you can use it in a group. So you can take uh, your whole team and run through the Adobe material. Fantastic. I, I will link to as many of these as I can in the transcript of, of the podcast. So you can go directly to the show notes on Workology and, and get all this great list of amazing resources. Appreciate that. As we look to the next 30 years of work, what emerging workplace trends or technologies do you think will have the biggest impact on people with disabilities? I have a lot of faith in the millennial generation. They are bringing so much more inclusive and transparent ideas into the workplace. I think in 30 years, you're not going to see people in categories. I think uh, diversity goals based on categories will be irrelevant. I believe that what we'll be seeing is that the workplace accommodates everyone and everyone has their unique needs and skills. So I think that's going to be really exciting. Uh, there, it's time for that kind of transformation to have. One of the things that needs to be done, I believe, is that the HR policy and hiring development needs to go through an inclusive design principles. We do that in design, we do that in engineering, but I think that that concept of doing customer interviews, uh, including people with disabilities or people in different um, diversity categories, they need to be included in these conversations so that when you come out with a new policy, that policy is inclusive from the very beginning. So I think, um, I think the HR policy hiring have a lot to learn from design and engineering when it comes to universal design. And that's exactly why we're talking to you. So much to learn. It's so many new information. And then when you throw in digital accessibility and technology into it, it's uh, much different than HR traditionally has thought about uh, accessibility and accommodations. Ted, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Where can people go to connect with you and learn more about the work you're doing at Intuit? You can follow me on Twitter uh, at Ted underscore Drake, D-R-A-K-E. And you can visit our accessibility page at intuit.com slash accessibility. I also have a personal site with a lot of information, uh, all of my previous presentations, uh, code snippets, whatever I feel needs to be shared. It's at last-child.com. That references an old CSS term back when I used to do a lot of CSS work, cascading style sheets. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to have been able to participate. I'm a big fan of Pete. And I've been listening to the Workology podcast for a while. I've learned quite a bit.
I loved having Ted on the podcast. I love his and Intuit's approach to inclusion, diversity, and product and software accessibility. It's important for tech companies to focus on accessibility and talk directly with their customers about features, enhancements, and changes, which is why I'm challenging HR leaders to get on the phone and build relationships with their HR technology software vendors. I want more accessibility for our employees. It is our responsibility as HR leaders to hold these technology companies accountable, start asking questions, and build those relationships. The Future of Work series in partnership with Pete is one of my favorites. Thank you to Pete, as well as our podcast sponsor, Workology. Join me for the first ever virtual HR Expo, October 5th through 9th. Demo and meet 35 companies, just like at the Conference Expo Hall, but all online. Let me and Workology help connect you with great HR technology and service providers at virtualhrexpo.com. That's www.virtualhrexpo.com. HRexpo.com. HRexpo.com. HRexpo.com.